My name is Nicole Warshower. I'm fairly new to Trusted Health, which is like the career platform for nurses. And tonight we are talking about skincare with Dr. Cartono. Say hi, she's amazing. Hi. Let me share my screen. Casey will let people in so you can all get the knowledge drop. All right. So welcome, we're really happy you're here. A couple things before we get started. We like to call these event norms instead of event rules, but we're here to have a good time. Yes, this topic is really, really important for you and your skin and really your well being, but we're here to have fun, be present, and just kind of enjoy each other's company a bit. Number two, we want to hear you when you want to be heard. So if you're not talking or if you don't want to talk um, or hear us uh, talk to your significant other about dinner or put your kids to bed, just put us on mute to make sure that we know exactly um, what's going on and we can progress through the event. Number three, if you have questions, please, please, please use the Zoom chat. Me and Casey, say hi, Casey. Um, we'll be answering them and filtering them where they need to go. So please use Zoom chat for questions. And there's gonna be a couple spots within the presentation that have spots for questions. And so we'll kind of filter those in as we can. And then the last one, this is hypercritical for, for me and Casey on the community team at Trusted. Your feedback means so much to us, good, bad, and different. We wanna hear it. We're developing a lot of really amazing virtual events being in the space that we are, and we want to make sure that they fit for you and for your other nurse friends. These events are open to any nurse. So as you see more coming down the pipeline, um, we wanna make sure that we're building the right events that you wanna see. So give us your feedback during the events and also on the post-event email. It really does mean a lot to us. And let's go. So with that, I wanna introduce Dr. Francisca Cartono. She is a board certified dermatologist practicing in Michigan. She's part of a dermatology private practice group that's seeing patients currently via telemedicine during the COVID-19 pandemic with sprinkles of emergency office visits. Mm -hmm. She's using this time to educate and help patients in a variety of online platforms such as Zoom talks, Instagram live events, while getting her hours in at home as a self-taught barber, chef, barista, and preschool and first grade teacher at home. It really, really resonates with me. So um, thank you so much for being here, Dr. Cartono, and then I will leave it to you now. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you, Nicole and Casey. Thank you for the invite and hello to everybody, uh, to all the nurses that have joined. Thank you for uh, coming and joining us at the virtual event. Um, and yes, yeah, so I gathered this uh, project together uh, and slides together to hopefully try to be useful and be uh, provide uh, advice that you can uh, bring to the workplace. And especially when in this day and age with all the pandemic situation around us, um, thank you very much for all your sacrifice and all your help and all, all the efforts that, that you put on the front lines of this pandemic. So it's just a little bit of something that uh, uh, hopefully I can give back and contribute and make your workday easier and uh, uh, help out with any skin concerns and skincare questions you may have this evening. All right, so first slide. Um, go ahead and go to the next one, Nicole. There we go. Got it. Yeah, so my background. So I'm a board certified dermatologist. Uh, I came from the West Coast, actually from UCLA and moved my way further to the Midwest and eventually went to uh, Michigan State, Ohio State and back to Michigan for private practice. Uh, my practice right now, I tackle medical dermatology for majority of it. I do cosmetic as well and also um, clinical trials research. I'm involved in that as well. And then surgical uh, patients for skin cancers. I, I handle those as well. Uh, we're currently kind of in a lockdown state. So we are, uh, getting ready to open up, um, but I've had a few days where I had to wear PPE and, and 9 to 5 masks for a, quite a few hours, half days of um, clinics, and I, can, I can't even imagine how, how difficult it must be uh, to carry on with N95s for a whole day, uh, especially in situations where it's a critical care unit. Uh, I think um, we'll go over how to overcome all that because I know how frustrating it can be at the end of the shift. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And then, so yeah, the outline, basically PP in your skin, sun protection, I'll touch on that because can't be a dermatologist without recommending some sunscreen options. Uh, and then also skincare, that was a high on the, the request list too in terms of info. So 
I uh, fire away with any questions at any time and I'll, I'll help out with answering any skincare questions you have. All right, uh, go ahead, next slide. And so we'll start off with uh, the skin and PPE. So these are kind of like the, uh, the typical images of what PPE can do for over a prolonged time, um, starting with the bruises and the chafing and the breakdown of the superficial skin that can happen. Um, this is all the, the, the issues at hand that hopefully with certain creams, certain tips and tricks, uh, we can help your skin recover as fast as possible. We can strengthen the skin too. I think it's impossible to not have any marks after a full day of wearing um, adequate PPE, but we'll talk about the tips and tricks we have. Go ahead. Um, and so friction is a big issue. So uh, the tight fit, the tight seal is something that needs to be there. Um, and our skin consists of the epidermis and the dermis, and the epidermis is a superficial portion, and that's the part that gets sloughed off and, uh, with the chafing and the friction. Um, deeper down there, where your blood vessels are a little bit further, the dermis can get squished and smushed, and you get bruise marks afterwards. These are red blood cells that extravasate and go into the surface of the skin. Um, there are certain antioxidants, certain creams that we can make use of to have our um, uh, hemocytorin and then the leaked blood vessels to make them go away a bit faster. I think there's tips and tricks on that. Um, in the cosmetic world, the lasers are a big deal in terms of removing bruising. Uh, it's not very uh, reasonable to think of that as an option uh, during this day and age for, for things that are uh, the, the bruising from PPE related things. Um, and then also the the air that we breathe and when we hyperventilate into that mask, um, I think just adds on to the issue of trapped moisture, trapped bacteria, as well as I think with, with warm temperatures and trapped moisture, we worry about yeast overgrowth as well. And so all that then can contribute, especially if it's a hair bearing area, um, worry about folliculitis or infection of the hair follicles. If it's in someone who is prone to acne or prone to having rosacea from the get go, um, those predominating features will just flare during uh, the times where you must use that mask for a prolonged period of time. Uh, sensitive skin patients might even have a lot of um, uh, eczema flaring as well uh, as a result of all the chronic irritation from the barriers uh, from the protective equipment that we have to put on. Um, so a couple of things that can help in terms of the friction itself. So you can stuff something that's an actual barrier in there, but then you compromise the seal of your mask. And so a lot of times that are thin enough to be used that doesn't um, seal the mask properly or like Vaseline, um, Vaseline, zinc oxide, duoderm gels, hydrogel. So it, it is thin enough that it won't create uh, an issue with the fit of uh, the seal of, uh, of, of your mask. So I think they'll pass the fit test. Uh, but th there are other things beyond Vaseline, zinc oxide, and duoderm. They're a little bit, um, have a little bit oomph, they have a little bit properties to, to help our skin regenerate new skin cells a lot faster and better. Um, so these are, these are usually wound creams that we use in the cosmetic world when we laser off people's um, epidermis and try to, for rejuvenation, anti-aging purposes, we intentionally hurt the skin. We know there's some creams that, can, that, that we can prep our patients with. So they can recover much faster. Uh, so the, these wound creams are, are the Stratomed is a wound gel um, that we use uh, pretty often actually in the, in the setting of uh, skin cancer surgery or cosmetic laser treatments. Um, Dermend um, is something that in combination with Arnicare has Arnica extract as a plant-based extract that's an antioxidant, as well as vitamin K that can help with uh, relieving of the bruises. Um, and elastin nectar is uh, something that is more in the pricey um, uh, range, uh, but it is something cosmetic of a gel that uh, if you happen to be on that, if you happen to use elastin products, think of using those to help your skin regenerate on the times that you're off your shift and you have like a good maybe like 10 hours to recover. I think using these products will save your skin quite the, um, the stress of, uh, of continuously day in, day out, wearing the, the masks without uh, help in regenerating. Um, so wound dressings are popular too. So Mepitac and Tagaderm or the film. Tagaderm is more of a thinner film. You guys know all about it for the drainage and IVs access and um, they're, they're barriers that we use uh, instead of a regular Band-Aid. Mepitac is a little bit um, uh, popularized more, I think on social media. 
um, as something you can stuff in there on the areas that tend to be the pressure points of your mask. Uh, but you have to be careful. They are pretty thick, so definitely get fit tested afterwards. Um, in terms of um, how to take care of the skin after you shift too, I think gentle washes are very important. Don't use anything that's acidic in terms of washes or, or, or acne busting washes because those tend to be very acidic in nature and they'll just irritate your skin. And you just need a wash to clean the skin. So I like the gentle cleansers like CeraVe, Cetaphil, and Neutrogena Hydro Boost are pretty good ones. The CLN wash is an important one to know about because that actually has sodium hypochlorite. So sodium hypochlorite is literally bleach, but very, very gentle amounts that you can uh, wash the face with it, wash the body with it. It's a common one that we as dermatologists recommend in our eczema patients that tend to have a lot of staph carriage on their skin. So the CLN wash is available over the counter. So it's something that you can Google on Amazon and, and obtain. How do we determine our skin type? So there's different ways to classifying skin type. Um, we as dermatologists classify skin types mostly on Fitzpatrick skin type or color, but um, are you referring to like oily or sensitive or um, uh, irritated skin perhaps? So I think if you're trying to figure out where you fit in terms of do I need gentle washes or do I need degreasing washes, am I oily or not? Um, I think uh, try to uh, get a sense of at the end of the workday, do you feel, or during, in the middle of the work day, do you feel like certain areas when you blot it that you have tons of oil on you or not? And then you run on the oily side of things. If you are, um, tend to be dry, let's say like you go to the pool and you come out of the pool or you go to the gym, you wash yourself with like soaps in public places. Do you tend to feel like irritated afterwards, feeling like everything's dry and tight? Then you definitely run on the dry side of things. And you have, if you have both things, um, feeling a sense of oiliness as well as, as dryness, I think you just have fall into that category of combo skin. And um, so I think when you pick your products, uh, you know, correlate it with what feels good for your skin. I think there's like a feel good test for trial and error, these products. Um, so Casey, the, the, the questions come on and off really quickly. So just stop me if, if there's uh We actually have quite a few right now. Away. So okay. it's just whether I can, I can read them out to you as we get them. Um, so mm -hmm. I've been breaking out, uh, uh, breaking out terribly along my chin and under my mask line. What can I do to combat it that won't be too irritating? Okay, good. So that's a very good question. So I think it goes back to going to the, the idea of what's causing it and why and treating that. So if there's a lot of inflammation around the mask area, um, I think I might have some pictures. Go ahead to the next slide, actually, Nicole. Um, bacteria can be a main source. If you don't tend to have much acne in those mask areas, and all of a sudden, after a couple of days of the PPE, you notice, like, why is my cystic acne flaring all of a sudden when it has been good for a while? And then I think it's just the entrapment of moisture, the entrapment of P. acne's bacteria, the entrapment of staph bacteria sometimes, too, um, can trigger that. So a prescription antibacterial uh, cream or lotion or gel from your family doctor or a dermatologist can help definitely a twice a day application oftentimes. Um, but over the counter, you can start with antimicrobial approaches. So that would be the CLN wash that you can get over the counter. It could be that benzoyl peroxide wash that you find in the acne aisle. And with these washes that are antibacterial, especially with benzoyl peroxide, try to go with the lowest percentage. So you got to read the label, like flip the bottle around and look for a 2.5 three percent instead of like ten percent because the higher the percentage of benzoyl peroxide the more drying and degreasing it gets so it's good for those like oily type of patients that they just hate the grease on the skin uh, but if you tend to run sensitive and the masks are already irritating you hop over to like 2.5 percent because it's equally antimicrobial um, across the spectrum it just ends up becoming more irritating and more degreasing the higher percentage you go um, so i think yeah the cln wash the uh, benzoyl peroxide washes would be good, as well as um, maybe getting a prescription of a topical antibiotic would be good as well. Um, there are some anti-inflammatory oral um, uh, uh, supplements that you can get over the counter. So niacinamide is a popular one. It's inserted in a lot of creams too, you might notice. So niacinamide taken orally can calm acne, can calm rosacea. So if you don't have the time to get a prescription, go ahead and, and actually um, um, go ahead and get the niacinamide supplements to take over the counter twice a day if you can't uh, get a prescription necessarily. Um, I think I saw a question about CLN. 
Yes, so um, I think you answered one of them. You said that it was over the counter. Um, and it's like another uh, nurse asked um, if the CLN wash kills MRSA and staff. Yeah, so it's, it's basically bleach. So yes, it's, uh, it's, it's sodium hypochlorite. So it's, it's, uh, so for eczema patients, we tend to recommend jumping to the pool because uh, there's, there's lots of studies and the biggest one is done by uh, a famous pediatric dermatologist in, in Northwestern. And um, they looked at kids that swim in swimming pools, chlorinated water. Uh, when you follow them over time, these kids, when they're eczema kids or prone to eczema kids, they end up doing lesser flares of their bad eczema when they consistently expose themselves to bleach water, which is what swimming pool chlorinated water is. Um, and so then there's recommendations for us to tell parents, to, hey, just put in a full top bathtub, pour in like a quarter cup of actual bleach and let the, the kids, um, um, you know, just enjoy the few minutes of their time in there. Um, but to recommend that takes like two, three visits because it's hard to say that to someone who has like a three-year-old uh but uh, so so the concept of developing this bleach water that's so dilute that's not toxic and be able to make it into a shower gel form i think was very um very neat um and so yeah um, will it make you super dry what was the rest of the question there uh well we have a few questions oh, here what? so um I'm just gonna start at the top so we don't so I don't lose these to be honest. Um, is okay. Arnicare used as a preventative? Um, no, the, the gel I don't. So I think there's sublingual Arnicare or Arnica over the counter. So I use that preventative uh, when I do injections um, cosmetically to prevent a lot of bruising and speed up the duration of bruising. But you can use the gel after the fact. So after you come home from your shift, you notice that there's bruise marks, go ahead, use it three times a day. Um, and that'll speed up the, the healing process oftentimes too. Um, but yeah, so I don't recommend using it to prevent necessarily. Okay, awesome. And then it looks yeah. like um, one of the nurses has had a lot of itchiness after her shifts and the creases and around my nose. Any tips? Yeah, so is it like around here probably, right, where we tend to get some scaliness sometimes too. So that's seborrheic dermatitis. So that's actually a uh, combo of that maceration and friction and moisture entrapment. And sometimes when we tend to have yeast, just like what dandruff is, and so it tends to flare. And so a little bit of, um, you can do a combo of 1% uh, hydrocortisone, which you can get over the counter easily. And then you can probably find antifungals over the counter. So that would be your, you know, your jock itch creams and your toenail fungus creams. Uh, and so you can mix it, uh, you know, like a piece of each and put it right there, hydrocortisone and antifungal to try to calm it down. Sometimes you don't need the antifungal. If you just have hydrocortisone at home, start there. Start with the hydrocortisone first. That already calms down the redness. But if there's a lot of scaling involved, like a dandruffy scaling, um, add the antifungal in there. Do it twice a day. Um, and it is a cortisone. It's very mild. And so cortisones come in seven strengths. And the over-the-counter hydrocortisone is so mild. We use it on, you can use it on, on baby skin. It's, it's pretty mild and gentle. So it is okay to, to use the cortisone over there. That's super interesting. Um, mm -hmm. next question is what are the best products to help relieve and get rid of scarring? So it depends on what kind of scars actually. So th there's a variety of scars and scars are tricky. They're, they're like the flu. <laughs> it's so hard to get rid of them sometimes, but it depends on the, what kind of scar. Let's say it's a scar from the mast as an acute scar is very recent and onset you have the best chance of uh, allowing it to heal the best way possible. So invest in some of these wound healing gels. The Stratomet is one of them, but it doesn't even have to be that. Vaseline is really the best thing that you can put on there when you don't know how the scar is going to turn out and it's a fresh new wound. Um, if you're allergic to lanolin, which is a big component of a lot of Vaselines, petrolatum over the counter, um, try to pick with the lanolin free ones, just in the case that you have a, this rare allergy to lanolin. Um, and so I think Vaniply ointment, CeraVe ointment, those are some of the better brands um, than, than pure, um, you know, lanolin or petrolatum. Um, uh, and then keep, them, keep the area moist if you have a scar. So these are all recent scars. So keep them moist, silicone gels, Vaseline, petrolatum, all those help. Um, reducing tension, so the stretch of the scar. So if it's an area of the skin that tends to get stretched a lot, you want to keep it together. And so that's why I think some of the uh, wound gels also form a film to try to keep the skin together. 
so that it doesn't move. Um, there's studies done where we would inject, the, one would inject Botox in the areas of, of scars and the areas that get Botox oftentimes heals much better than areas that don't get Botox around them because when the skin is Botox, the, the skin doesn't move much. And so movement plays a big role in terms of keeping the scars small. Now, old scars are hard. So old scars can be a variety as well. Some of them are ice picks, some of them are broad, some of them are rolling, some of them are chicken box scars. Um, and so those can be approached differently. I think your doc can help you probably guide you towards like what best to invest in. But old scars are really tricky. I think you have to, uh, some of them need to be cut out. Some of them we can um, burn off. Some of them we can laser off. Some of them you just can't do any much about it. Um, uh, so yeah, so it all depends on the type of scar, yeah. All right, thank you for this. So Just for the sake of time, we'll move on to the next on? section. Yeah. And okay. if those, yeah, if they don't get answered, um, then we'll kind of come back to those questions for yeah, sure. Sounds good. All right. So I think uh, next slide is whatever we talk about in terms of keeping the facial skin good. I think think about using those approaches to your hands too, because the same thing on the hands, uh, on the face is probably happening to your hands if you hand washed. Uh, uh, like more times than usual, and maybe even with stronger sanitizers, higher percentage ethanol alcohols. Um, and so gentle cleansers, moisturizer, maybe a, a topical steroid by prescription, maybe an oral um, antibiotic might be needed if there's infection happening in the creases that are having cuts. And so I think those are the things that you can think of is gentle cleansers, strong moisturizers, emollients, wound gels, and then prescription wise, your steroids and antibiotics. All right, we need to move on. Oh, <laughs> ding, All ding, right. ding. All right, guys, we're going to be giving away a few things tonight. Um, we have five different care packages um, that uh, Dr. Cartano and her team put together for you guys. So I'm super excited about this. Um, you'll have to correct me if I say anything incorrectly. Um, but one of the things that we're going to be giving away is one of the products we've actually already talked about, the Stratamed. That is a wound dressing, um, but it also provides a silicone barrier and it's a full size. And so you can put that up under your um, PPE to kind of help prevent any any of the friction um, that's causing the, the wounds on the face. Um, also included are sunscreens, tinted sunscreens, moisturizers, and gentle cleansers. And there might be, is that, I think that might cover everything. Oh, CeraVe um, and Vaseline's. So mm -hmm. a little package there. So I actually downloaded just for this a randomizer on my phone to do this. And it looks like we're 36 participants. So it looks like our lucky winner is going to be number 33, who is Sherry Stevens. You're our first winner of the night. Yay. <laughs> Sherry, if you wouldn't mind, I know you're one of our trusted nurses because I recognize one of your names correctly enough. Um, if you wouldn't mind just direct messaging me your address, your shipping address that you'd like us to mail this to. If you have any problems, just let me know. And we have four more packages to give away. So. Yep. Stay tuned. Yeah, I'm excited. Thanks, Casey. All right. So yeah, in case you, I put some pictures together. So in case you guys are in the grocery stores, drug stores, I think they're easy to recognize these brands like CeraVe, Cetaphil, um, uh, the Neutrogena Hydro Boost or that creamy hydrating cleanser we get. And that's what the CLN looks like. It's a bit more pricey than the others, but if you tend to be eczema prone, impetigo prone, um, infection prone, this might be something that you want to just uh, invest in, in terms of the wash. Um, and then in terms of the dryness, if you fear that with any of these, you, ha you have such sensitive skin that you still dry out. Within three minutes of your shower, within three minutes of stepping out, just lather yourself with, the, with a good strong moisturizer, which is on the next slide. It's going to be any of these. So they, good moisturizer doesn't have to be expensive. They don't have to smell good. I prefer actually that it don't have fragrance in them because fragrance tends to be irritating. Um, and uh, Cetaphil, CeraVe, Aveeno are kind of trusted brands amongst dermatologists to, to recommend as long as you're not allergic to any of the uh, components to it. But they're free of fragrances, which is pretty big time um, of an irritant. And then um, other things would be uh, there's this thing called, it's a coconut derivative, cocomito purple betaine, which is one of the emerging common allergens as well. And a lot of the baby and um, products and, and things that are geared toward babies and kids, unfortunately, still have them. And so I think if you want to have a good solid moisturizer, you can use head to toe uh, and don't clog your pores on the face even. Uh, CeraVe, Cetaphil can't go wrong. The Aveeno one has oatmeal in it. It's oatmeal derivatives, oatmeal are 
is like nature's steroid, uh, nature's hydrocortisone, basically. So it helps if you don't feel like using a 1% um, cortisone to the face. I think try the Aveeno products. It has a lot of uh, oatmeal derivatives in it that are soothing. All right. So, and then these are the bear creams, gels, and dressings that we talked about. I think the Tegaderm, the Mepitac, you guys are probably very familiar with these. These are dressing uh, for wounds. Um, definitely get fit tested if you're using these underneath the mask. It's very important that you you make sure your seal is intact. Um, the Stratomeds have different um, different uh, kinds, uh, but I think the wound filming, uh, the, the film forming wound dressing is actually one of the better ones. And then the other one is just for scar therapy. Um, I like the CeraVe ointment as a, as a lanolin-free Vaseline alternative. Aquaphor is good. It does have lanolin. And then zinc oxide and arnica you can find over the counter easily. I thought I saw a question pop up. Hmm. We do actually have a few questions. Um, okay. We can go through these really. So um, with the CLN, does that make, would that make us really super dry? Um, does it strip the moisture barrier of the skin? Which one? The CLN. Um, oh, the CLN wash. Um, wash, no, yeah. I haven't heard yeah. that being very um, drying at all. Um, as long as you just, you never want to leave your skin without a moisturizer though, after, um, after using an antibacterial wash. So just make sure you put a layer of moisturizer afterwards and that should solve the issue. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. um, another nurse has developed, um, and forgive me if I mispronounce this, Angular chelitis, little oh, cuts chelitis. in the corner of the mouth. Um, yes. Since wearing PPE, any recommendations? Yes, definitely. So same thing with the question earlier about the nose. These are corners and body folds that tend to trap some liquid and moisture. In the angles of the mouth, oftentimes it's a combo of our saliva uh, as well as some yeast action. So I still recommend patients do a little bit of steroid, even though you know steroids can feed funguses. Um, but a little bit is enough to calm the inflammation though. So 1% hydrocortisone, you can mix it with something that kills the yeast. So again, a little bit of antifungal in there. And I actually tend to mix it with zinc oxide. So then you have something that blocks the water, which is a zinc oxide, something that kills the yeast and something that kills the inflammation. It's not going to look pretty because it's a thick paste after you mix it all together. Um, but use that at nighttime, definitely, or when you sleep, um, uh, uh, to let that sit in um, and treat the, the skin area there. So I think that's a, an easy home remedy almost for, um, for angular colitis. If you go to a dermatologist, they can prescribe you things that like are two in ones or three in ones, so they're all in one tubes and more practical. But if you don't have the time and you have these things laying around at home, you're, you're good, you're gold. Just get a, your cortisone, your antifungal, and your zinc oxide. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, are there any products that can reduce hyperpigmentation? Yes, yeah, so we're gonna go about, uh, should I go into skincare routines then? Because I think I have a couple of products highlighted there. Okay, perfect, we can go ahead that. Okay, cool. Got ahead of myself, another giveaway, guys. This is my first part. So exciting, I can't even win anything. Um, all right, so I already think my number is number 20. So we will see, I'm so sorry. One, Lindsay's iPhone. <laughs> Whoever is Lindsay's iPhone, if you wouldn't mind just direct messaging me your full name and shipping address. On Zoom. Yeah, on Zoom, please. Yeah, and Sherry, I'm, I still haven't received yours either. Sherry, so if you want to go ahead and shoot that over to me as well. All right, Lindsay's iPhone. Lindsay's okay. iPhone. <laughs> All right. So, uh, Let's talk about uh, skincare routines and sun protection and all that good stuff. So sun protection is key, not only medically to prevent skin cancers, but we'll talk about hyperpigmentation. So if you want to treat your hyperpigmentation or maintain the results you've gotten from getting rid of a lot of hyperpigmentation, then you can't live without sunscreen. So sun protection is key. And there's big groups, two big groups of sun protection or sunscreen. One group is our physical blockers. These are big molecules, so they shield away, reflect the sunlight. And then there are chemical blockers, smaller molecules, teeny tiny molecules that absorb the energy from sunlight so that the energy doesn't harm our uh, cells, our skin cells. Uh, the problem with these big, big molecules that are our physical blockers, zinc and titanium, is that they end up making the skin look grayish or 
ghosty or uh, white and sometimes purplish if you have darker complexion. Um, and so they're not very elegant. The chemical blockers are teeny tiny molecules. They're chemicals, uh, but yet they feel so nice and sheer. And so uh, the, the concern now is that like, are they causing reactions or is there systemic absorption? And so if you want to be of the safest of the safest sunscreen, stick with the physical blockers. You can always mix it with the foundation or color of your choice to make it tinted. They do make them tinted. Um, I do prefer the tinted sunscreens, especially if you're fighting hyperpigmentation, you want to get rid of pigment. The tint itself is actually iron oxide molecule, so it helps block even more wavelengths of light, including the visible wavelengths. So the blue light and red lights, everything that comes through our electronic tablets. Um, then there's also DNA repair enzymes in some sunscreens. They're embedded in. These are enzymes called photolyases. So we all have mechanisms in our body to repair DNA damage that happens over time from UV light, radiation, you name it. Um, but we have like police officers that, uh, cellular, on a cellular level that repair it. Um, and so there, are, there is some technology out there that is able to harvest that and try to put it in a bottle of sunscreen. And now it doesn't work as well as what nature intended in other organisms. Humans don't have these photolyases. Um, so it's from different organisms harvested. Um, but there's a couple of them out there on the market. They'll be priced a little bit higher, but they seem to have a better efficacy than just physical and chemical blockers that we have right now. Other than that, protection of clothing. So you may already have your sunscreen on your face, but if pigmentation is something you hate, um, then you want to invest in a good hat. Uh, clothing as well, and those will tend to burn on the body. Um, highest place for melanoma incidence in men is in the upper back, actually. For women, is the back of the leg. So i be careful. And then um, lips, there are a lot of lip glosses, lip stick colors, and other things that, that have lip protection as well, because squamous cancer is going to affect the oral cavity, including the lip. And then there's oral supplements, heliocare, niacinamide, over-the-counter. Their last, um, uh, the last finding showed that it can reduce squamous cell skin cancers by 23% of reduction of chance of skin cancer uh, if you take niacinamide twice a day um, uh, for a whole year. Um, and then the reapplying every two hours is key. So you can wear it once, but then you got to reapply. Maybe midday application, two hour application is what we recommend. Um, the sun brushes, mural brushes are very popular amongst my patients because they can do it over their makeup. And even if you're staying indoors, the question is if it's quarantine, do I have to actually apply sunscreen? Yes. Um, if the goal is to be as least pigmented and least blotchy as possible, and you wear your sunscreen every day, even when you are indoors, because visible light actually matters visible light causes us to hyperpigment. All right, maybe we'll do a couple more. So um, skincare routine principles. So sun protection is one basket of my principle of um, how to keep our skin youthful and, and kind of like age gracefully, slow down the process of aging, not necessarily stop it because we can't, but sun protection is a big component. Um, then comes antioxidants that can actually be a helper to our sun protection. Uh, and then there's, uh, there's a category of anti-aging after a certain age. It seems like majority of you guys don't need this yet. So I think when we're in our 20s, I think um, uh, it's a different mindset almost than, than when we uh, hit a couple of you know, decades or years older. Um, the anti-aging becomes something that, that a lot of people invest in. But I do think that there are certain things that fall in this anti-aging category that even useful skin can benefit from early on. Um, and then moisturizers are a big thing too. I think uh, even if you feel like you have oily skin, and your skin will thank you and, and, and uh, appreciate the fact of, uh, with the use of a nightly moisturizer, at least if you're not used to using it every day. All right, so, and then we'll go into, we went over this already, so I think we can skip this one. Oh yeah, and then it's important for sunscreens to have an activity sunscreen and a daily sunscreen. Like if that sunscreen doesn't feel good, you're not gonna use it. So I think a daily sunscreen that's lightweight is key uh, that you should have. Um, and then in terms of um, windshields and windows, so UVA light goes through it. Uh, that's something to remember. And then SPF it, on the bottle, which is 30, 40, 50, it only indicates UVB protection, not your UVA protection. Uh, and we have UVB and UVA that, that comes through this plant and the ozone layer just blocks UVC. Um, so I think wearing, um, wearing the appropriate clothing, wearing the appropriate sunscreen, um, and positioning yourself in the right places if you work by windows or, or drive a lot, I think it's key. Okay, and the next slide. All right, maybe I can answer some questions too. Yeah, I'll do the giveaway, Nicole, if you want to handle some of these questions while I'm, while I'm figuring out who it is. You but bet. Number we'll back. Um, we've got a couple anti-aging questions, mostly on Retin-A, retinols. I think we'll talk about that in a minute, right? So let's hold mm -hmm. those for a second. Looking, looking. 
What's your favorite splurge and spend sunscreen? My favorite splurge is actually one by Color Science and it's called Even Up. So I have a lot of hyperpigmentation issues here and there because of the darker your skin type, like my skin type, every time I cook, every time I burn myself, every time I cut myself, every time I get a little scratch that I scratch too hard on, it hyperpigments. And so, and it's a, the, the scratch or the thing might be just for a brief moment, but the hyperpigmentation will last a whole month or so. Even a little pimple can, can leave something for that long. So uh, the even up is pretty thick in terms of consistency is good protection. I want to say it's in almost like 20%, like 11 to 20% ish of the physical blockers. It doesn't have chemical blockers um, in it. So it's very, um, very clean product. So that's my splurge on sunscreens. And then there's a second one actually. So on the days that I don't want to wear a thick tinted uh, sunscreen, I like the Isden product. It was, a, it was one of the pictures there with the photoliases. Um, I like that a lot. I think it's $50. I consider that still a splurge, <laughs> not as expensive as the color signs, um, but it is, it, it is very, very efficacious um, and they make them tinted and non-tinted too. Awesome. And then one more, and then we can talk through the winner. Um, Marie says, I believe I'm allergic to sunscreen because when I use it before I break out, I use SPF 15. It doesn't cause me to break out and itch. Any recommendations? So I would recommend first, if you're not in the mood to get patch tested or, or photo tested, um, then stick with just mineral based, lightweight sunscreens and see if you still break out with that. So just only zinc and titanium ones. Um, I think um, there's a brand called Aven. It's over the counter, like A-V-E-N-E. -E. I think it's an SPF 30 to 50. Because 15 is really like not the best uh, coverage because um, we don't really use like a shot glass or a golf ball size of sun amount of sunscreen. Uh, it's just not what we're, we can tolerate. So I think I would pick it, see if it's a chemical blockers that you're allergic to. That's the more common. Then the little things like fragrance, I do patch testing. So I test for a lot of allergies from contact, from touching, from using things. And so sometimes it's the filler ingredients and not necessarily the sunscreen ingredients that you might be sensitive to. And it might be a common ingredient shared amongst different sunscreens. And then if that fails just by trial and error, come on in and we can, or find someone near you that can do um, photo patch testing. Because sometimes we, we're not allergic uh, from a cream from just putting it on. It's from putting it on and then seeing the sunlight. Uh, I think if you handle fruits and vegetables uh, in, in, in the sun, you can appreciate that because a lot of bartenders that make drinks out in the sunlight, they'll get uh, that reaction from lime um, and light. That combination creates a, uh, um, you know, an irritation pigmentation. Sometimes it's very rare, but you can develop that to sunscreen particles. Got it. We've mm -hmm. got um, a couple questions. One's on body hypopigmentation and one's on a recommendation for a tinted moisturizer that is vegan doesn't have chemicals if you can answer those quickly then we can do the giveaway and then move on to the other good stuff you've got tinted sunscreen that is safe mm -hmm. i think i would do color science face shield is uh, that one vegan or chemical free? is a vegan it's chemical free for sure um i don't know if they're vegan actually so i think that's something you uh i'm sorry i'm not too familiar with uh, which is it, but they're the cleanest uh, in terms of fillers and being reef safe and chemical free and tinted and lightweight. Got it. And then yeah. one, Octavia asked, how can I reduce body hypopigmentation? Oh, hypopigmentation. So there's blotchiness with, with lack of color. Um, I probably would want to know why it's happening because there's the reasons behind it. It could be just genetic, obviously, but it could be vitiligo. It could be a fungus. It could be a you know, eczema, pityriasis alba, it could be a lymphoma of the skin sometimes, so which is very, very rare. So, uh, but maybe that, I think that warrants a consult maybe with the dermatologist. Fair. On a completely different note, Casey, how about um, a giveaway? Our winner is Gabrielle Nixon. So Gabrielle, congrats. And if you want to message me your address. All right. Thank you. Keep the questions coming. We'll answer them when we can, but we'll move on to the next set items. All right, so antioxidants. So whoever hated pigmentation earlier will love antioxidants. Um, so antioxidants that are to brighten um, the skin, they help your, they help scavenge for free radicals. So they help your sunscreen. They're like a sunscreen booster. You don't need to find them in one tube with the sunscreen, uh, but you can use them in conjunction. 
Uh, so a lot of antioxidants, especially vitamin C, is an, is, is an old-fashioned one. You know, we've used it for so long, and so we know a lot about it, but we also know how irritating vitamin C can be. And so in combination with vitamin C, E, ferulic acid, there's a lot of paper showing that you can tolerate the vitamin C better because um, you use it at a lower strength, but it actually um, can, can boost the efficacy too with combining it with vitamin E and ferulic acid. Niacinamide, something that you'll see in sunscreens and as well as, as uh, facial uh, moisturizers. Niacinamide is the oral supplement. You can take it orally and it, it is such a good scavenger of free radicals. It reduces the occurrence of squamous cell cancer in the following year or so. But topically, you know, it's not as strong as taking it orally. Um, Bakuchiol and green tea, these are all plant-based antioxidants. Good too for those who can't tolerate um, you know, other antioxidants. Uh, but collagen too gets degraded quite a bit with the sun. So with the antioxidants presence, it prevents the breakdown of collagen that otherwise would have happened so fast. Um, yeah, so I think the antioxidants are a must, but second to retinol is quite irritating. So you gotta be careful. I think common, I like the Alto one that I featured there, the Skin Better one, as well as the CE for like, but the Alto one for the super sensitive patients will be best because the more different antioxidants you have, the lower the concentration of each one of them. So it's more tolerated. All right. And then the elastin, oh, okay. We're on a different, <laughs> on a different slide now. So retinols, no, go ahead. You can actually move on. So the retinols is the next basket There's an, is the, in the anti-aging category. So retinols is kind of like the vitamin C, the, the antioxidant category. So retinols in the anti-aging basket is like the, the tried and true thing that can help. Um, and so retinol has a lot of properties that help with anti-aging, the skin remodeling, antioxidant enhances collagen, uh, laying down of collagen earns the skin. But the irritating factor, again, is the reason why some people are not on it. Um, you know, it's, it's, some people ask me, give me the high strength retin-A that you can get me so it's more effective. But it also might mean that you won't tolerate it because it's more drying the higher in percentage it is. So I think you have to weigh your feel-good factor with the ingredient factor too. So I think you need to be able to tolerate it like a marathon. And if you can't do it every night, try to do it every other night. Try to get a good, solid, strong uh, uh, moisturizer to use with it. But the more drying your retinol means the more moisturizer you slather on and the more core clogging action might be happening. So, uh, and then just as of last year, I feel like Bakuchal, another plant extract, is an alternative to retinol that you can find over the counter. Um, yeah, it's less well studied. So I think you'll see prices from like $7 all the way to like $70. And I'm not sure exactly like if the percentages uh, really make a difference. Uh, but they, when they did the studies, Bakuchal did have the similar effects as retinol. Um, and then peptides are the other things that peptides and growth factors, they help in terms of anti-aging uh, by allowing our cells to deposit more collagen there and, and age uh, in a slower in a slower way. Uh, I like combining this a lot with the procedures that we do in the office. So I prep the patient's skin before we do microneedling, before IPL, before lasers, before fractional surfacing. So we want to make sure that um, we prep the patient so they can recover fast as fast as possible and as good as possible. Um, so I think anything in this category tends to be a pricey as well. So you want to make sure you pick the one that you can tolerate. All right. And then alpha hydroxy acids. So let's say like can't tolerate the retinols, any of them, can't tolerate the antioxidants. Um, then you can prime your skin a little bit. So I like these over-the-counter alpha and beta hydroxy acid products, actually, especially if one is not ready to jump into uh, retinols yet. And so using these, I can you know, start off at once a week, twice a week, three times a week, um, and you can actually build yourself. And once you can tolerate these over-the-counter acids, fruit acids, maybe give them up in exchange for an actual retinol or <laughs> Uh So I think I like using them as a stepping stone. But don't do them all together on one day because that's something that's what, when we don't know in what category it falls, you use like two different fruit acids and then a retinol on the same day. And the next day you're like red and, and itchy. All right. And then moisturizers. So I like having moisturizers as a standard um, thing. So um, keep it simple with the moisturizers. It, you just need something that infuses moisture, if not something that traps moisture. So you shouldn't be paying super expensive prices if it's just a moisturizer. Um, and so I think a gentle cleanser of the moisturizer is key. Um, good to pair it up, like I said, with retinols or your vitamin E, vitamin C. Um, and um, hyaluronic acid is a a component that you can find in high-end moisturizers. Hyaluronic acid, what it does is it draws water. It draws water from the surrounding area, including from the top of the skin if you had a moisturizer laying on it. 
um, but it also draws water from the surrounding skin. So it can sometimes be super drying if you tend to be dehydrated and you run dry. Uh, so be careful with hyaluronic acid. Like if you come in like with scaly eczema, I wouldn't put you on hyaluronic acid. I'd put you on like Vaseline to trap the water in there. Um, and then light versus thick moisturizers, weigh that, know what your skin type is and don't pile on too much products. Like if you pile on six products versus piling on three different products, you're probably more likely to get acne or clog up your pores with the six products. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And then, so yeah. So the, back to the principles there, I think sunscreen, your SPF must be over 30. Um, the antioxidants, I think you need your uh, vitamin B, vitamin C. And uh, so vitamin Bs are nice to by this, vitamin B3. Um, and then the retinols, peptides, bakuchiols can go into the anti-aging category. And then hyaluronic acids uh, and ceramides and, uh, and the fruit acids can, can be embedded into a good strong moisturizer, whether it's just ceramides like CeraVe or an exfoliating moisturizer. Um, if you want to have the glycolic or the lactic acid component in there, um, these all fit a certain purpose. So don't use four things from one basket. Just pick one in each. <laughs> or for those who are 20 year old, years old, you can probably skip the, the peptide retinols side there if you wanted to. <laughs> All right. Any questions? I know we have quite a few and let's see. Turn it back to where we started. Do you want to do the giveaways? I can get these questions if you okay, want. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah. yes, I actually already picked out the winners and the numbers haven't changed. So I can actually tell you who they are. And that gives me time to for time for you to send me your addresses. Okay. Um, numbers were two, which is number two is Angela Houston. If you want to go ahead and shoot me your address and number 24. And that was Marie, if you also want to shoot me your address. So that concludes our final winners. Um, so I'm excited about sending you guys a... Uh, Here's, I've got the spot where the last question or the, the first question from the last segment was asked. So question uh, about hyaluronic acid. I've been told hydrolyzed hyaluronic uh, acid is better because the molecule is smaller and penetrates further. Is this true? Is there a hyaluronic acid product you would recommend? Um, so I think hyaluronic acids are really tricky. I think they work best when I inject them as a filler. When I, when I, um, I just have people rub hyaluronic acids, you know, in theory, it sounds so good, but I really don't think they're the best moisturizers. I think if you're post procedure, you just had an expensive laser procedure or a peel or something that you want to use a, a hyaluronic acid gels and serums for. Yeah, I think that's fine. But, but I'm not a big fan of pushing hyaluronic acid moisturizers actually. But I think if you have an extra budget, go ahead. I think the Neutrogena Hydro Boost is a good hyaluronic acid um, uh, based over the counter. I think um, PCA uh, brand has a good um, you know, niacinamide with hyaluronic acid uh, moisturizer as well, but I'm not too big on, on keep your splurge on the peptides, I'd say, than hyaluronic acid. Go ahead. You can fire away. I got a quick hug. Hold on. Um, oh. and <laughs> And then at what age would you recommend oral sun protection supplements for prevention? At what age? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've actually given them out to kids that tend to burn every summer when they're out there. Um, and so I, I don't, that's actually a good question because we haven't, uh, we haven't delved into it far enough. And I think vitiligo is a big um, subset of patients that would need it as kids and, and under 18. But I think adults over 18, go ahead. I think get started with niacinamide if you tend to burn every single summer. I think I always screen like, do you tend to burn every single summer despite your best efforts? Go ahead. I think the niacinamide is a good one to take on vacation throughout the summer, uh, depending on your lifestyle and skin type. Got it. Um, would love to hear your favorite nighttime moisturizers to help recover skin. So I splurge on that elastin skin nectar as part of my moisturizer. Um, let's see, I change around because I try a lot of different things, but I do actually like the Aveeno. So I have very dry skin, I have eczema prone skin. So the Aveeno balm, which is really, uh, it's from that same picture that I, that I put up with the balm version. So it's, it's actually on times when, when I'm super dry, I think that's what I use. Um, and uh, I think other moisturizers I've used in the past, even like that Cetaphil in the big tub, I think it's fine for the face as well. On nights where I feel like I'm a little bit oily is a hot day, 
Um, uh, I use the PCA ones actually, and then the Skin Better ones. The Skin Better has an interfused base. I like that moisturizer. Um, and then Skin Better has a Hydro Boost moisturizer. So I like the Skin Better brand, Elastin brand, um, and the PCA. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. What do you think about Istin Met Meliclear? So I haven't tried that one actually, so I don't know what the active ingredient is of that one, but I think the only Isden products that I've tried and it seems to actually um, like in terms of the feel as well as the efficacy is the Isden sunscreens and the Isden's, um, um, it's their Bakuchiol product, like a nighttime serum. But I don't know what the molecular. Larissa would love to know your typical skincare routine from day to night. You touched on this a little bit, but. From day to night. Um, so I think sunscreen is what I start with. So I think the Color Science Face Shield is what I use uh, as my go-to. Um, I wash with CeraVe hydrating cleanser, something gentle. Then it's the face shield. Um, uh, in the evening, um, I use the Elastin Skin Nectar. I actually have a revision neck cream. <laughs> Um, as well as uh, I use a Retin-A once a week or so because that's as much as I can tolerate. And on the other nights, um, I'm trying out this Bacuccio one, a different brand as well. Um, but before that, the Isden was my go-to, actually. I'm not too sure about this one, so I won't promote that one. <laughs> um, let's see. And then the Alpharet has actually Alpharet, uh, not Alpharet, Skin Better. Alpharet is the Retin-A uh, that I use. And then Skin Better Even is the antioxidant of choice with Skin Better Alto. So I have like five different things at nighttime, but I only use one in the morning. <laughs> it all depends on your schedule. I think if you can fit more in the morning, go ahead, fit it in the morning. Retinol should be reserved for the evening though, because they get degraded by sunlight. We have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to try to pick a few. And if you don't get your question- Go out, ahead, fire away. We'll do our best. Um, OTC recommendations to use or avoid on rosacea prone skin? Avoid your vitamin C products, antioxidant products, avoid your Retin-A, try to avoid astringents and anything acidic. Uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, to use. To use soothing products. So uh, vitamin B, so nice cinnamide products. So avoid your your vitamin A and vitamin C's, but use your vitamin B's I think, for rosacea prone uh, skin. So nice cinnamide moisturizers. Got it. Uh, mm -hmm. Thoughts on under eye creams. Do you think TNS illuminating cream works well? You know, under eye creams are really tricky. I think you got to find the one that doesn't irritate you because under eye creams um, are very potent on very thin skin. Um, so I don't think any of them work 100%. It all depends what, on what your issue is. Um, so I think that might be appropriate. Use it for about like two or three months if you don't see the endpoint you want. Um, try to get maybe a, a consult to see what's going on because sometimes it's a genetic hollowness, sometimes it's allergies, sometimes it's eczema, um, sometimes it's pigments rather than wrinkles. And so it depends on what to target in the us. And sometimes you know, a filler can fix all of the above in the appropriate patient. Uh, so yeah. We've got a couple retinol questions back to back. Favorite splurge and save retinol. And then how is retinol different from hydroquinone? I don't know if I pronounced oh, it. Oh, okay. So splurge retinol is a skin better alpha ret. This is the only thing I can tolerate uh, in terms of retinols. Other ones tend to be very, very dr drying. Uh, the save version would be the ROC brand over the counter, it's like $19. Um, the... Um, what was the other, the last question? How is it different from hydroquinone? Different. Oh, hydroquinone prevents pigmentation. So hydroquinone is not a retinol actually, um, but hydroquinone is a potent substance as well, just like retinol. So whereas retinol helps us in um, uh, unclogging of pores for acne concerns, as well as laying down of collagen for anti-aging concerns, the hydroquinone blocks uh, a step in the processes of the skin that recruits pigments. So hydroquinone is more of a bleaching agent. Got it. Mm -hmm. Long-term effects of Accutane. Is there a safer alternative? So long-term effects of Accutane. When Accutane is used in the right setting for acne, it's short-lived and it doesn't cause permanent damages. Um, we, it's a strong medicine. It's not for everybody. And so I think good counseling and, and understanding what the patient's expectations are key. But if you're if we, we select the drug in the appropriate patients with the appropriate expectation, it shouldn't leave any long-lasting uh, side effects. Um, 
And then alternatives, yes, there's always things outside the box. And so definitely be honest with your physician when you talk about it. You don't, Accutane is not the, the only thing that can, uh, that can help a person with acne, but it is the only thing that we can call a cure for acne. So it's a permanent changes in your skin, shrinks your oil glands um, uh, pretty permanently and creates changes in the skin permanently as well. So after you're done with Accutane, the goal is for you not to be in that stage before when you broke out with cystic scarring acne, whereas the other treatments for it that we have currently none of them are permanent fixers. They calm the acne breakout, but when you're done with the medication, if you're still in that hormonal surge to create acne, you'll just create acne again. We just held it off so it doesn't scar you, hopefully. Um, so yeah, there's other options. Um, and, and depending again on where the acne is coming from, is it hormonal in a 30-year-old? Is it um, a teenager that's just entering puberty? Is it in someone whose parents were both on Accutane at one point? So sometimes there's genetic factors at, at play. All right, we're going to do two more questions. Um, I think this one's really important. Should we wash our faces during the day if we can? A 12-hour surgical mask humidity is rough. Yes, I think if you can, you should. Um, and also minimize makeup, minimize sunscreens. Don't wear any of that um, camouflage or makeup. If you can on the day um, where you have to wear your mask, take a little um, supply of a gentle cleanser like Cetaphil that you can take with you. Actually, Cetaphil makes even face wipes I recommend over the counter. You don't need water that way. Let's say you're stuck. You don't have access to clean water. You can just wipe your face that way or but at least, yeah, wash the face if you can midday if you have a long day of a shift with the mask on. Um, for, uh, what was I going to say? I think for those that tend to break out a lot, ask from your physician maybe an antibiotic lotion you can use right after you wash your face, apply that on, and it'll help keep things at bay. I think the reason behind no skincare and makeup too is I think, I don't know if any of you guys, your, your facilities repurpose the, the masks or not, but when there's product on it, I think there's data to show that it's very difficult to get the cleanliness that you want. Um, so the other reason behind it. Thank you. Last one, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a twofer and then we can close out for the night. Thank you for taking mm -hmm. all the time answering these questions. No problem. Um, so the first part, is there any truth to using red light to build collagen and prevent wrinkles? And then the second one, which I'm curious too, any recommendations um, to reduce pore size? So red light and reducing pore size. Red light, I haven't seen good data behind it, but light does help actually. So there is evidence that things like intense pulse light, which are office procedures that we do, that it does end up depositing collagen as a nice side effect because you have you follow the patients that over time after doing it year after year periodically, and they do look like they deposit more collagen. Light does stimulate something, whether it's the heat or is it the actual light. I think it's really unclear. We know heat for certain does, but IPL isn't that hot, and yet it still does it. So, so I think IPL does help over time to deposit collagen. Not sure about the red light. Um, let's see. And then pore size. I think intervention wise for pore size, microneedling seems to help actually with reducing pore size. If it's not an intervention you're seeking, retinols, retinols would be good. If you have super oily skin, you can tolerate the astringents and the toners. I think that would help uh, or the acidic fruit acid products would help too. Uh, but retinols would be the first line. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Cartono. Um, I hope Thank everybody you so really much. enjoyed it. This was so informative.